Hello, everybody, and welcome to Turn the Page, Season 4, Book 18, the final book of Twista Plot. <laughs> Say it ain't so. Calling oh, he's upon us. Outer Space. Bring, bring. Are you there, Outer Space? Hello, Outer Space here. Uh, I would like a large with um, I, uh -huh. no sauce, no cheese, left beef. Thank you. Yeah. I did that. You know? You know that means you went with the, you I made did the it. original image. I didn't make the original image, but I made that order. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what did he, you know? <laughs> Why? Especially because it doesn't seem like the beef would be especially relevant. Well, I, at the time, uh, at the time, I I would eat the beef, but like, you know, it's for those who are not, were not around the early earlier internet of course now. regale us with the story of the, the you know, story of the no it's, shopping pizza it's, it's a nun nun pizza with left beef it's just a it's just a picture right when domino's first first ever allowed you to make your own abomination online on domino's.com mm -hmm. and make your own mistakes make your own make your own mistakes why don't you take responsibility for why this pizza sucks it, it lets you c customize exactly how like i want light normal or extra of like all the toppings you could also mm -hmm. choose what side to have you know like i want this topic on all the pizza half the pizza you know for people who don't like certain ones so they took off all the toppings but then they added beef to just the left side of the pizza and they just that was they took a screenshot of that but then they showed the, the pizza actually came with you know what they ordered and then i was like that's stupid i want to do it and I did it, and it was nothing. <laughs> and it was bad, and I ordered bad pizza because <laughs> I it, thought it, it was feels funny. Like in the shop for the original version, in the shop there was someone who was like, "You know what? Fine, that's what you asked for. You've made my day slightly easier. I will accomplish this to the best of my availability. I will give you a nun pizza with left beef." It feels yeah. like in your instance, they didn't even try. They were just like, "This is a joke. I will treat it as such." Yeah. I but like I got it, I got it. It it was exactly as it said. Well, okay, I I do have to say a little bit of a critique. Um, some of the beef did roll to the other side of the pizza. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> maybe That's it's not because with left beef. <laughs> maybe it's That's because a there was mess nothing. of tiny meatballs and uh, a yeah. giant naan. May mayhaps it was because there was no cheese nor sauce to keep the beef in place. But excuse me, that is not my problem. I <laughs> ordered it on the left. <laughs> I don't ask you how to get it done. I simply tell you to get it done. Work your magic, pizza wizard. Anyway, we're reading twist a plot uh it's the finale of twist a plot and i don't mm -hmm. think that we've ever had more derailed intros than twist a plot so if if anything this is a very fitting intro for a, the final episode of twist a plot <laughs> we're doing anything possible to distract ourselves from the fact that it's, twist plots are over. it's, it's almost. dying it, almost uh but yeah the final one is just it's calling outer space it's just calling outer space i love this cover as you were mentioning before, it's just so distinctly rendered night or 80s, 90s. Ahead of its time. No. Uh, it was ahead of its time. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it the vibrance of these colors is very... Yeah. It's, there's a, it's, it's doing some. There's a kid with some headphones on sitting in front of an... I can't believe it's not a, you know, Ghostbusters vacuum. Though apparently mm -hmm. in this world, it's, it doesn't seem like it is because it looks like it's probably the phone from which he is calling outer space. I presume. That makes sense. Some sort of a ham radio where he's tuned into an intergalactic empire's radio station. Uh, you know a ham radio from yeah. radio stations? <laughs> a ham radio from radio stations. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want a nun radio with left ham. Please, thank you. <laughs> um, but there's also like a, a head getting absorbed mm -hmm. into these are both being absorbed into a UFO. That actually reminds me a lot of the Emerald City in uh, Wizard of Oz. Yep. I, get, I, I can know only why. describe uh, one of these heads is the head of uh, Baron Harkonnen uh, of, of the latest Dune films. And the other is Onion Head when he was young. Slimer from the, the Ghoul Smasher films when he was yeah. a wee young lad, when he was a new ghost. <laughs> Hello. I love the world. I love you. Mm, I'm just a tidy little guy. I like going around and hey. mm, dusting and vacuuming. <laughs> oh, there's a spot over there. Let me go get that. <laughs> yeah. I love the world because it rewards man. me for my uh, for my efforts in cleaning it up. <laughs> 
I sure hope nothing will happen to change that. <laughs> or Slimer origin film when... <laughs> It, it's gonna happen at this point. It rate. will. Don't you? It will. Lion King live action two. It's. God. It will. Anyways, uh, that movie made so much money. <laughs> Lion King one. But, but then, like, you never hear people. I don't know. I've never talked to a person who's seen it. It it, it seems What's like happening? these things make a huge amount of money, but no cultural impact whatsoever. I have because they already made that cultural impact twenty five years ago. I have not. I have not talked to. Whenever I've ever talked to anyone about the Lion King live action movie, I have never met someone who's actually watched it, and yet it was like the, one of the most profitable films, you know, in mm -hmm. you know the years surrounding that. And it's one Did of those things that just makes me feel that was just like. Let's all make a pact not to talk about this. This, this, yeah. this is Fight Club rules here. You yeah. can't tell anyone. I think it was a different movie. I think it was probably a different movie. Like everyone went in, they saw something else. Like, you know, that was actually Inception. Like they went in, they saw Inception, uh, then they came out and they talked about it. And they're like, oh yeah. Oh, I just for oh, I forgot that I actually signed up to go see the live action Lion King. But anyways, uh, okay. Uh, Calling Outer Space. It's a book that we are going to be yeah. reading. It's so, it's so generally themed as... What? I mean, how E.T. do you think this is on a scale from zero to E.T.? Ooh, I'm going to give it an extra out of terrestrial. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to give it a um, one out of space. Uh, yep. I like uh, some extra terrestrial and some uh, left, left Reese's Pieces. Thank you. Anyways. We're back in the realm of dedications. Oh, to Katie B, whose laughter and hearty, you can do it. Got me through this time. To Pat, Tim, Bill, and Dave, who said the same thing once before. That's Each book, this person needs to be encouraged by a new person to complete, but only once. This this reads as sweet, but it's it's ended up confusing. <laughs> it, it's confused me more than Inception did when I watched it, and I didn't think it was like really that hard to follow. And everyone was like, "Oh my god, dude!" You know. <laughs> I do remember that. that was I do wild. remember that exact period of time. I, I feel like I feel like Christopher Nolan kind of responded to that like, you know what? No. I don't want anyone to get any of these and just starts ramping it up all the way to 10. Yeah. <laughs> you understood too much. Stop. I want to make something that you cannot process or digest or enjoy. Well, that's why he does all the audio mixing like he does. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> For the fourth time. I will, I will not derail any more. Would you beware us about this book? The final book, Twist the Plot Style. <gasps> oh. Don't read this book from beginning to end. You are about to embark on a perilous journey into the uncharted vastness of outer space. The fate of Earth depends on the very decisions that you make. So read the directions at the bottom of each page very carefully. Decide which choice is the best and then boldly follow your instincts to the correct page. The slightest mistake will mean danger, galactic destruction, or even death. Hang on. Well, that's not escalation. Well. <laughs> or a stubbed toe. <laughs> okay. And? <laughs> but don't worry. If you're clever, courageous, or just plain lucky, you'll accomplish your mission and return to the sunny safety of Earth once again. Prepare to beam into an extraterrestrial adventure that you won't soon advent, uh, forget. You'll be shocked to find out how many answers you receive when you find yourself calling out of space. Go on to page two. We should read this book from beginning to end. Yeah, we, we, we've never... We, we were told we're allowed to make our own decisions, right? Yeah. Well, decision number one, I ignore that. And I'm going to read from beginning to end. Let's start yeah. on page two. Let's start on page two. I mean, that is the next page, so. Win the science fair, you? Fred's snickering words replay in your mind. Fred's computer club had a good laugh at your expense. Of course, you were bragging that your radio telescope would take the blue ribbon. Maybe it would have been better if you'd skipped the part about contacting extraterrestrials. E.T. phone home? <laughs> Okay, immediately. Immediately is the answer of, uh, <laughs> on a scale from zero to mm -hmm. ET, the answer is yes, immediately. Yes. <laughs> Fred squeaked. Your face reddens again at the memory of Fred's wisecracks. 
You lean out your bedroom window and yank in the parabolic scanner cables dangling from the roof. Angrily, you screw down the antenna hookups to your crystal radio receiver and transmitter. Let them laugh, you think. This is a villain story. Get yeah, more data. Absolutely what I was thinking. <laughs> Let them laugh. We'll see what they think when I blow up the universe later. <laughs> and then maybe and then I'll maybe, kill them. And then maybe I'll not even die. <laughs> <laughs> Page three. Soon the dish-shaped antenna is activated. It's time. Hands trembling, you transmit the message. Uh, yeah. Calling <laughs> outer space. Calling outer space. The signal repeats automatically as you lock keys in place. In one hour, the receiver and recorder will automatically switch on to C. On, wait, will automatically switch on to C. You shiver at the thought, if anyone answers. In bed, hours later, you hear the receiver click off and on two times. Maybe it's nothing, but you have to check. Not wanting to wake your parents, you tiptoe to the equipment to rewind the recording tape and push replay. Cracking sounds, crackling sounds blast your eardrums, and you jump to reduce the volume. Wait, <laughs> you jump to reduce the volume. You, can I just do that? Uh, is it conducted through us to the Earth, such as electricity? <laughs> I'm assuming it's like you jump away from the the from it, but like, mm. yeah, it does make it seem like if you just jump, you're just like, oh, this makes things quieter. Thanks. You strain to listen through the static. Suddenly, hear something faint, pulsing throbs. Slowly, the sound becomes clearer. Thump, thump, thump. Pause. Thump, thump. Could this be outer space returning your call? Shaking, you grab a pencil and you scribble as the pulses repeat. Are they dots and dashes like your signal? No. Three and two must indicate shortwave radio frequencies. But which would you turn into first? Three kilohertz? Two kilohertz? Or if you just think it's static and go back to bed, go to page 19. If I'm entirely honest, I think the fact that we think the Wait. Is it, is it is it dits and dashes a la Morse code? No, they sent three and two signals. That could totally still be <laughs> Morse, not code. Morse code. At all. <laughs> it's only if you end up with something like six characters in the same character or six entrants in the same character that you're like, this isn't Morse code anymore. And even then there's probably variants like international Morse code variants that still have six. So no. ultimately, I want to reject out of hand the the assertion that this must be related to the radio frequency that we need to tune into. I kind of want to go back to bed. I mean, if the if the media has taught me anything, there's only one Morse code and it's SOS. And it's da 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 Exactly. da 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 And it was one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's, that's, the, that's way off. This doesn't exist. You know... Rihanna really messed up by sampling uh, Soft Cell Tainted Love for SOS rather than just making the rhythm and bass line <laughs> the, the pattern for SOS in Morse code. Da -da 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 -da. See, but then when everyone picked, whenever anyone picked up the radio station, they would be like, oh my god, we need to help her. <laughs> well, she even says in the lyrics though, SOS, please someone help me. Like, I know. It, it, you, she's already communicating that we've, message. We failed her. We failed Rihanna. <laughs> she's <laughs> she, she's been that's been airing. It's been on the, the airwaves for so long, and nobody has helped her. Everyone's it like, was this is such on a bomb. Billboard charts for two months, and everyone was just like, mm, yeah, nice bomb. What, What's what that? A, what a bomb. Mm, you definitely ah! need help specifically in this instance from me. <laughs> All right. What a great song. I, this is Rihanna. This is not a bop. Please help. Please <laughs> help me. Wow, this is Ooh. catchy. <laughs> I really love this remix where they start playing the fire alarm in this club. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> uh, anyways. Yeah, let's go back to bed. 19. It's probably fake. You listen to the pulse once more to see if you've missed something. Your heart sinks. The sounds are only static reverberations from a competing signal. It was dumb to think you'd pick up anything this soon. You climb into bed feeling foolish, like an idiot, as you fall asleep. The next morning, the doorbell wrenches you awake. Who's up this early on a Saturday? Why isn't Mom answering it? The note taped to your headboard explains why. Went to an antique show with Dad. I'll be back at four. The bell rings again. Groggy, you stagger your, to your upstairs window, peer through the curtains, and look down. 
A huge golden skinned man looks up and smiles, his metallic skin shining in the sunlight. Your skin crawls. A golden skinned man? Then you spy a metal case tucked under his arm. The bell rings again. Are you going to answer it? If you're lucky, maybe he'll go away on page 34. Go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have an option to answer it. This picture, I wish. He's, <laughs> he's got, he's looking down at us. He's towering over us. He's looking down at us. He's very bald. And his mm -hmm. forehead wrinkles, like, they look like a, what's that, what's that one dog? Wolf. Wolf from uh, that's Star it. Trek. Yeah, that's my favorite dog. <laughs> Wolf, my dog. All right. 34, you flatten against the wall, then hear the front door open. Eekaboo, I see you. Okay. The man croons. Does this clown think you're a baby? <laughs> What's the idea walking into people's houses uninvited? You storm downstairs, but cool off when you see him standing on the porch smiling. He hasn't come inside. What's this peekaboo stuff? You demand. His smile fades. Oh, isn't that right? Uh, my species book said young humans like this game. Species book? About humans? Go on to page 35. Allow me to introduce myself. Finder at your service. He says, sweeping past you, and then he mutters. Data on primitive planets is so limited. Primitive, you start to protest until you see him up close. He has no hair, no eyebrows. He must be advanced. So futuristic. So futuristic, so chic. His eyes are like green pools of water, and stranger yet, even in the dim hall, his skin glows. Wow. So advanced. Unbothered by your stare, he says. When you are done scanning me, uh, we will go. Go where? You ask, puzzled. Ah, to my spaceship and Zeta-12, of course. He cradles the metal case. My molecular energy scrambler and reassemblers all warmed up, and we must return before the search council adjourns. His brow ridges wrinkle. But I got your signal, so you already know that. Did Finder come because of your space message? Maybe, but it seems like he's confused you with someone else. You're not willing to point out his mistake, however, and miss the chance for a ride into space. Not gonna point out his mistake to miss a ride into space. All aboard for Zeta-12 on page 93. Oh my god, this is the final page. If we were reading this book from beginning to end, we'd be, we'd about, be about to be done. Oh no. Wow, a trip to Zeta-12. Okay, so Finder's a little bit odd. He seems harmless, and you can always ask about this search council stuff later. Adjusting his metal case, Finder explains that it holds a portable transport ray. He pulls you out onto the humming case and clutches your arm. An instant later, you're aboard a sleek, futuristic ship. It must be bald and without eyebrows. Mmm, that's how you know. <laughs> yeah. The molecular transport scrambler still hums when Finder settles it near his feet to study you. He claps his hands. Ah, fine extracelestial sample <laughs> for the conference. Now skeptics must believe there's life in this galaxy. You mean I'm your extraterrestrial? Extra celestial. He corrects. And I'm very glad I found a human subject this year. You gulp. Did you actually act rashly by coming here with Finder? Grab the molecular scrambler and beam home on page 16. Or if you're an open-minded scientist, be Finder's EC on page 23. Uh, How don't... do you feel about science? I like science. Oh. I'm an open-minded scientist. Also... Uh, what it's worth, he hasn't been mean. Yeah. There's no sign of threat or danger here yet. No, he's just creepy and weird. Exactly. Harmlessly uh, creepy and weird. So far, harmlessly creepy and weird. Oh, boy. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Uh, even if Zaytans aren't human, you're too curious to back out now. However, you don't know what they want to do with you. What exactly does an EC do? You ask Finder. Do? He pauses. Why, nothing. Except have fun. So like a Twitch streamer or... Just kidding. That's me. <laughs> uh, Finder... I have no fun. Don't you worry. Finder explains <laughs> more while guiding you to your quarters. The search council will talk with you. And make tests, of course. You are asking about the nature of those tests when Finder nudges you through a door. Wait. Don't go in that room before you look around on page 84. Uh, 
Wide-eyed, you stare into a room alive with blinking video games and flashing holographic images of Earth. Finder rushes out the doorway. I'll send in Krill for playtime. Right away. He calls back. Playtime? Krill? His words make sense when a spheroid robot glides into the room waving spidery jointed arms. But you can't beat me. He beeps rudely. <laughs> you stare. That's it. This Krill character reminds you too much of Fred. Maybe you should find a way off this crazy ship. <laughs> Run away on page 44 or stay on page 63. That's this floating the mechanical spider alien orb <laughs> insulted me once. God, so Fred. Such so a Fred. Fred. This is the thing that concerns me. <laughs> is that this spheroid floating alien with spider sharp, sharp spidery arms wants to beat me. That's the final straw. He reminds me of this rude guy I know. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Now, they didn't give us a complete description of Fred. I know. Fair, when we were back on Earth, it's entirely <laughs> possible he's circular, floating, spher spheroidical. Yeah, maybe we're the bully. He's just trying to fit in at school. <laughs> you know what? We should stay a while. We should we should <laughs> get, grant ourselves some empathy for Krill, such that when we land back on Earth, we can approach Fred renewed. So true. Or we can figure out his weakness so we know Fred's weakness. Either or. I'm pretty good at video games. You tell the boastful robot. I wanna play. Krill toots, <laughs> zooming around chairs and under a hammock. So, Fred, you walk over to one of the video games. Lifelike holographic men play a game that looks like lacrosse. <laughs> you hit the buttons, but it doesn't affect the game at all. <laughs> this is no fun. That's just men playing lacrosse. <laughs> Finally, yeah. disgusted. When I take a controller to watch lacrosse, I'll tell you, it doesn't work there either. Doesn't work there either. Except sometimes coincidentally, and at that time, I pop off. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm the best lacrosse player there is. Uh, finally, disgusted, you walk to the front door, muttering, ah, Forget it. I'm finding a new room. The robot freezes. No. He beeps. A glass door slides across the doorway, locking you both in. At the same moment, the video screens go black and they disappear. They were just holographic images. Yeah, we knew that. When they are gone, all that's left is a room with glass walls. You gasp. In the next room and the next are the other extra celestials, each with their own version of Krill. Different creatures, you realize, from different galaxies. Finder's a zookeeper, a zookeeper, not a scientist. You sink into the swing as Krill announces. I'll own your companion forever. Then he bumps into you, annoyingly. Krill could even make you appreciate Fred. The end. Such a Fred. Such a Fred, man. My only companion, the wow. only person who stands by me. Such a goddamn Fred. <laughs> That's so Fred. He's my companion forever. So Fred. <laughs> so Fred for this. What? What? Are we, we, are we gonna run away from this guy? Gonna run away from this guy on page 40-something? I guess 44. I wanted to play video games. Mm, we might be able to circle back. Hmm. You shove Krill aside and bolt for the door. His taunts follow you down the hall until you turn a corner. Halting to get your bearings, you look around, seeing nothing but an eerie chamber several yards ahead. Colored swirls of light coming from inside the chamber make you shiver, but you race for it anyways when Finder sweets into view, hollering at you. Wait! Don't go in! Stop! It's dangerous! He sounds panicked. Are you one- and you wonder why? Is he afraid of losing his- EC, or is he really concerned for your safety? It takes just a moment to decide. If you think he only cares about a human subject for the council's study, climb into the chamber on page 5. If he hasn't harmed you yet, decide not to enter the chamber on page 41. I don't like that phrasing. Well, he hasn't harmed us yet. It is- he ha literally hasn't yet. So are we supposed- <laughs> well, okay. I mean, if we're following the rules, he literally hasn't harmed us yet. It, we don't have to go here if he hasn't harmed us. I know, but it feels like we do. Let's do it. Again, let the let the book take the first shot and all that. Oh my god. Okay, anyways. 41? That what we scroll past something, strange. Mm hmm You step back from the chamber as Finder reaches your side. He pats his heaving chest. Oh my chamber. You would have been Shortness of breath keeps him from finishing the sentence, but he faces you with a sad, green eyed gaze. 
Are all Earthlings like you? He asks. You flush defensively. Like what? Finder shrugs. So troublesome. Yes. I've offered you adventure, companionship, and what do I get? His irritated words trail off, and he spins abruptly on golden feet, starting back to the main chamber. You follow. I'm taking you back. <laughs> I'm taking you back to the pet store. He announces <clears throat> flatly. Somewhere they must list data on a more suitable subject. Data? List? More suitable subject? A silly grin spreads across your face as you hurry along his heels. You could think of a perfect subject for a trip to Zeta-12. Oh, huh. That's messed up. This reminds me of Fred. It sure does. Your perfect suggestion appears on page four. <laughs> let's, let's see how long it takes them to get to Fred. <laughs> Fred! With luck, Finder might really take him to Zeta-12. Of course, Fred won't be suitable either, but he'll never make fun of you again. If Finder thinks you are too much trouble, wait until he gets a load of Fred. Back in the main lounge, Finder reactivates the molecular scrambler and watches while the energy cycle maximizes. You know, that. His cool eyes appraise you, and he wrings his hands. I thought you were a qualified EC. Reasonably intelligent. Curious. His voice drones. You chuckle, imagining Fred meeting Finder. Your chuckle becomes laughter. Finder's voice snaps you out of it. Well, extraterrestrial, however, extraterrestrial, uh, however, extracelestials mm. must be emotionally stable. Now's the time to mention Fred. Well, I guess you found my weakness. You sigh. But just so your trip won't be wasted, let me make you a suggestion. Minutes later, the scrambler delivers you and Finder to your backyard. You draw Finder a map to Fred's house and wave goodbye. As soon as you close the front door, you start to laugh once more. You can't help it. The end. Don't think this qualifies as a good ending just because we uh, got, a, got, got a guy kidnapped. <laughs> he made fun of us twice and we were like, go to space forever. We are <laughs> the villains. I just like page one. It was so clear <laughs> that we are the villains. And mm -hmm. now it's more clear than ever. All right. Uh, what was the choice? Let's see. There's another choice on page five. Oh, if we, um, we don't trust that Finder only cares for our safety on page five. Oh, sure, sure. Finder only cares about getting you to that search council. Of that, you're sure. After that, well, you won't wait for it. You hold your breath and leap into the swirling colors, expecting your feet to find solid ground, but they don't. Instead, your limbs plunge into banks of vapor. Both fearful and fascinated, you watch as your hands turn blue, your arms scarlet, your legs a deep dark green. Suddenly, a generator hums, and the air fills with a smell of bitter ozone. Then everything goes black. Have you floated somewhere over the rainbow? Find out on page 11. Very timely reference at the time. Hmm. <laughs> Incredibly, your eyes open again. You check to see if you're all there. Arms, legs, and feet are all attached in the usual way. But only after double-checking fingers and toes are you aware of being scrunched between two piles of packing crates. Squinting, you read letters stamped on each box. Saturnian shippers, hauling anything, anywhere. Saturn? I'd sure like to see that, you think? Peering around a column of containers, you look to the far end of the bustling warehouse. Rusty hover cranes load more crates aboard a huge spacecraft marked SS-1. Knocked knots of helmeted men scurry up and down the craft's ramps, shouting directions to one another. Overheard, the scene is lit by spotlights that cast hazy glints off transparent domes. You must be in a space station. The chamber must have transported you here, and you're not sure it's the best place to stay. Look for a clue for your next move on page 62. Creeping from the shadows, you look around the space station, hoping for an idea of what to do next. Your spirits soar at the sight of two silver uniformed men wearing shiny badges. Space police! As you peek around the far side of the Saturnian spacecraft one, you see an unused ramp flanked by people-sized boxes. You could stow away. The two men in silver head for the darkened ramp. Quick, decide what to do. Take a ride on the Saturnian spacecraft one, page 55, or ask the men for help, page 37. Nah, they both remind me of Fred. Yeah, so true. Such a Fred thing to do, such space a, police. Such a <laughs> uh, that helmet reminds me of his melon head. 
<laughs> his advanced bold melon head. <laughs> All right, page 55. <clears throat> you squeeze inside the crate just in time to be hoisted onto the ship by an electronic lift. The crate hits the cargo bay floor as elect electronic engines rev up, but you sense no liftoff or speed until G-forces press you against the inside of the crate. Then the bay is heavy with silence. The silence of deep space? A floating sensation answers your question. Weightlessness, pushing up the crate's lid. You instantly sail like a helium balloon towards the ceiling. One panicky lunge for a passing pulley sets you a spin, bouncing off bulkheads, slamming onto crates. Ah! Each stop is punctuated with a protest. Moments later, your flight ends. You crash to the floor in a rain of barrels and crates and lie there for several seconds panting. It looked like fun when the astronauts did it. You mutter, rubbing your sore spots. Bruises heal quickly in space. Do, do, do they? I have no clue. Like, because, like, bruises are effectively like a pooling of blood in an area that is being able to access, right? Could that be? I don't know. This is like if you elevate an area to prevent. I don't know. Maybe it's sound. I'm checking. <laughs> um, is the option that they don't heal? <laughs> is it's, it the opposite? It's, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> Na NASA has noted that cuts and bruises tend to not start healing until the astronauts are back planet side, which is why the space Good station God. and the craft is designed to be extremely low risk so such injuries aren't as likely to be possible. Oh my God. Wow. That is wild. I did not think that Earth itself was like giving us all passive regen. I didn't understand that that's what was going on. Yeah, it's various parts of the body, yeah. natural healings. Scientists still don't know why. Scientists, doctors are still not sure why <laughs> this is fully the case, but it's important. also posited that living in space could possibly halt the growth of cancer. Who do you think is going to be the first rich billionaire to get to 80, get a diagnosis <laughs> and go, I'm going to live in space. That's it. <laughs> you know, I think we all know. Hey. Uh, <laughs> See you up there, Jeff. <laughs> this is bruises heal quickly in space. Turn to page 56. That was fascinating. Thank you book for, for being so wrong that I learned something fun and new. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild all right feet planted again you wonder who or what switched on the gravity you spy a porthole across the cargo bay and in your haste to look through the round window you stumble over a crate its contents rattle ac across the floor but no one seems to hear finally you peer out the porthole and your breath stops because suspended below is a familiar blue white sphere halved by darkness above the dark rim a gleaming orb stands guard over a sleeping planet earth and awestruck, you almost don't react when the bay door swings open. Silhouetted against the light, a man roars. Who's in here? Well, you have two choices. Tell the truth and hope for the best, or in this jumble of boxes, hope he just won't see you. Um, hide on page 78. Well, actually, to be fair, it says, in this jumble of boxes, he won't see you. Hide on page 78. It seems to imply mm. that there's no risk. Although, is there a possibility we want to be like, uh, hello, uh, this is my stop. <laughs> yeah, please. Let me off, please. Yeah, I think so. I'm down. Yeah, let him betray us. <laughs> yeah, let the, like, let the book take the first shot. We are good, gentle it's souls. Me. <laughs> and the book will respect that, I think. Yeah. It's me. I I'm a stowaway. You confess? I only wanted to see Saturn. Honest. <laughs> okay. I th okay. I thought we were telling the truth. I mean, I guess we did want to see Saturn, but like, okay. I wouldn't say that this is the full truth, but mm. um, but okay. You tremble as you watch the man approach. A stowaway. He mutters. Oh, and an earthling too. He adds. Looks like we're going to be stuck with you. He says. Great, you think? You're really going to visit Saturn. You're going to have to be isolated for a while. Says the man. Some native earthlings carry germs that could be fatal on our planet. Your grin disappears. Isolation doesn't sound like fun. Hmm, tell me about it. Then you recall that Earth's astronauts were isolated for two weeks when they returned from space. It's worth two weeks alone to see the ringed planet. You follow the man to a, to a chamber in a distant wing of the ship. The Spartan room offers little comfort, but you have a view of space from a tiny porthole. Exactly how long do I have to stay here? You ask the man. Oh, not long. 
he answers, pushing a button that seals the room. Through a speaker, his voice crackles. We'll be able to tell if you're a disease carrier in about 150 years. 150 years? You stagger backwards to the metal bunk. You won't bother to ask for how long it'll take if you are a carrier. The end. I push back on the fact of even if they live a really long time, I push back on the mm. fact that they would consider 150 years not a long time because then what's a minute, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if you can converse with me on a level where you're in, like, we're able to understand, like, the quantized units of language that we are each using with one another, then your perception of time has to conceive of this uh, yes. and that. There is a giant gap between the two. Mm -hmm. Bare minimum is like, hey, a bit, you know, <laughs> like, there's, there's exactly a bare minimum is like, a, it, it's going to be a little bit. Bare if minimum. he said it'd be a fair wait, you know what? I'd be like 150 years. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's probably for someone who lives for a very long time. That's probably a fair wait. Yes. I push back on that. Anyways, he just wanted to be rude. He knew what he was saying. He's in on it. Uh, so mm -hmm. Paige. This is just corpses of all the previous humans that they're trapped <laughs> in. It. Uh, so page 78, we hide. Let's hide on 78. Crouched behind overturned metal barrels, you try and hide until a spotlight sweeps across the cargo bay. The man's attention is drawn away as someone joins him, and you scramble inside an empty barrel, leaving the top ajar to hear their words. Look at all this junk. I told him we were taking too much. The man grumbles. A second adds. Eh, what can we do? Then a solid kick rolls your barrel across the deck, activating the barrel's automatic vacuum pressure lid. Just before the cover clamp shut you, shut you catch a final phrase. Get us in these barrels into space. Go for an unexpected rise, ride on page 88. Okay. Without further warning, you're shot into an endless void. Trapped in the pressurized barrel, you see nothing. Hear nothing. The claustrophobic blackness makes you gasp, turning shallow breath to icy moisture that slides down the barrel walls. Only a sick rolling in your stomach tells you that the barrel's spinning. All at once, your stomach quiets. The metal cylinder seems frozen in mid-spin, suspending your legs over your head. An instant later, fresh panic grows and grips you. A brilliant rainbow-colored beam fills the barrel and your toes start to tingle. Someone is really scraping the bottom of the barrel this time. Discover who it is on page 75. My god. You feel your toes tingle, then the tingling sweeps upwards. Your whole body feels as if it's breaking into electrified particles. Moments later, you slam onto a hard, vibrating surface. Excellent! The Macron transporter beam is working again. I had hoped for something useful, but an Earthling? How wonderful! An excited voice snaps your eyes open, and you stare at a bearded man in a tunic emblazoned with a badge. Your head crowds with questions, but you can only stammer. How did I get here? On a Macron beam. Everyone knows if you shoot Macrons around space long enough, you'll hook some kind of creature. He shrugs, then pokes your arms. Ah, but the thing has been malfunctioning, and I feared it might only capture half of you. He jabs you again and announces. Ah, fortunately for me, you're all here. Fortunately for you. You yank free, sputtering angrily. Now, just what's going on here? Go to page 76. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is going to be fun. The man bows mm. stiffly. I am Sir Lexor, Knight of the Octahedron Order and Governor of Kor. Cartney fear smothers you as he adds. And you'll stay here until you help us. Before you can object, Lexor slumps in a chair. Lord Baramus has driven my knights and me from our planet, and now he's trying to drive us from the galaxy. His voice hardens. Look at my fleet. You follow his finger to a viewport. Strung out like a tattered kite tail are black spaceships linked together by laser cables. Wha Earth shall be my stronghold, a haven for repairing my ships. We wouldn't need to do so much repairing if you stopped tying them together with freaking lasers. His dark eyes narrow. Instruct your leaders that we come in peace. They listen to one of their own. Impulsively, you blurt out. Fat chance? Who listens to kids? Lexor's face reddens with fury. Hmm. Truly, that complicates matters, but you will convince them. Otherwise, it's war. You're not too crazy about this guy. First he kidnaps you, <laughs> then orders you around. Now he's spouting about war? Hmm. Uh, soon he's gonna kill the galaxy, and then... 
Yeah, I'm not too crazy about him. Yeah. Turn to page 61. Mine makes my laundry in. <laughs> Do the reds and whites at the same time end up with a bunch of pink shirts. Oh. Then he's going to kill us. Oh, my God. The reds and the whites together? That's messed <gasps> up. Oh, I'm glad I'll be dead so I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, at least it, at least he's just killing the galaxy, and that's all. Anyways, you don't think Earth's leaders will react very well to threats. Besides, if there's a war, you might be the first casualty. The sound of clanging metal makes you jump. In that instant, the knight's attention is diverted to a hunched old man, poised in the open doorway across the room. Think fast. Escaping through the door might be your last chance. All right, not much of a chance. Where could you go? Maybe the old man is more reasonable than Lexor. You could talk to him about a solution that doesn't involve war. Dive through the doorway on page 10 or reason with the old man on page 54. I'm just not seeing the future in diving through the doorway. <laughs> we're, we're very much captive. <laughs> yeah? You want to go 54? I'm, I'm fine with either or. I just do, I don't, I, I would be interested to see on page 10 why one would dive onto the doorway. Yeah, let's pick page 10 to see what kind of idiot would pick page 10. Hell yeah. You decide that your only chance is to make a break for the door. The picture's so good. It looks like a linebacker pushing Merlin out of the way to get a... a, a or it actually looks a little bit more like Gandalf. Pushing Gandalf down out of the way so that they can run and get a touchdown. It's so good. It, this, this child is made of tritium. This child is dense. This child... It, it it doesn't shove past the startled old man. This isn't shoving past the startled old man. This is intentionally tackling the old man. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, and the man is like probably twice as twice as big as this kid. It, it, anyways, uh, you decide that your only chance is to make a break for the door. You race for the lighted opening and shove past the startled old man, if that's what you call it. The bright corridor blinds you after Lexor's dim control room, but you speed on sightlessly. In seconds, the glare fades and you slow down. The only footsteps you hear are your own, echoing in empty passages. Is everyone asleep? Halls branch left and right. Which way? You can't decide. Panic flares, then on a hunch, you turn right. Take the right passage on... Wow, usually this is a choice, but <laughs> take a right on page 32. Your character makes a choice. Go, do it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I mean, they knew that was the right one. Yeah. The corridor is inky dark. Three yards into the blackness, you slide your hands across the rough walls for guidance, steadily creeping forwards. I'll find a way out of here. You say doubtfully, trying to reassure yourself. Then you freeze. In the pitch black hallway ahead, you sense a presence. Something, well, hiccup, waits, lurks just inches away. You cringe at a rustling near your hand. Who? Who? You are stuttering when a hand yanks you through an opening in the wall. In less than a second, an another hand clamps over your mouth. You are in deep space trouble. Can things get any worse? Find out on page 53. Strong arms loosen when you stop struggling. Weak from fright, you turn to see the old man. <laughs> Hush! He's got a bruise on his forehead. <laughs> he warns a finger glow of lighting his face. The two of us are here to help. You recognize him immediately. I shoved you when I ran away from the control room. You say. He arches a white eyebrow and rubs his hip. Indeed. You, Quite a push. <laughs> you gasp when a shimmery creature with misty eyes and a, and a blowfish mouth enters the circle of light. Don't be afraid of me. The old man assures you. We're working together. The scientist in you studies the creature covered with iridescent scales. It reminds you of a trout in Miller's Pond. The rest of you recoils as it extends a three-fingered hand to stroke your hair. Lobo. It purrs. Lover. You back away. Who needs help? Wait, who needs help anyway? Then again, it's a big, cold spaceship out there. Slip away from this creature and the old man on page 14, or ask about their offer to help on page 36. I mean, he's still willing to cooperate with us, despite the fact that we shattered his hip. That is true. But is that because he's exacting revenge? Mm. Mm. Good point well made. But I don't think so. Probably. We didn't do anything to the fish person. Yeah, so. we didn't do anything to Flubber. Let's check out page 36. Help me? How? You ask, waiting for their story. 
The old man grumbles. By dispatching you from this ship before you can cause any more trouble. Oh. Me <laughs> cause trouble? Listen, Mr. Mr. You fumble for a name to call him. He straightens. Marlon! Sorry. Okay. No, yeah, no, no, no. That I was saying okay because I could see. <laughs> he straightens. Marlon the Mentor, trusted advisor to my lord Baramus, a true leader of the Octedron. Prompted by an impatient purr from the creature, Marlin adds, And here is, of course, Bree from the planet Kor. He is our star system's greatest space navigator. That scoundrel Lexor abducted us from Baramus's fleet ship. You peer into Bree's opaline eyes and say, Then you've been kidnapped too. Marlin nods. Yes, with Bree to guide him, Lexor can rule the galaxy and never be stopped. He thinks we've come over to his side, but even now we're working to thwart his deadly plan. A warning in Marlin's gray eyes chills your blood. Next, on Lexor's schedule, he says flatly, is your planet. You shudder. What can I do? Marlin tells you on page 17. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Marlin's finger globe bobs in the dark. Come, you will leave in my secret escape craft in the hangar bay. Baramus will be attacking soon. When he approaches, I'll radio him Lexor's exact position. As he halts abruptly below an air shaft, you collide with him. However, he continues, ooh, my hip. <laughs> my lord won't attack until all of the civilians are removed, so my job right now is to get you out of here. His civilian stings like an insult. Marlin boosts you into the air shaft. Come now. This will lead us into the hangar bay without Lexor's guards spotting us. Finally, struggling into the shaft behind you, he hands Bree his globe. Bree's incoming? You ask, feeling a sudden loss. He must stay behind to send a mind message to the Corian fleet. They'll join Baramus during the battle. The old man's knee in your back makes you wish for more time with the strange, brave Corian. Blubber, he said. It felt like an important word, and then it hits you. You're going off alone, spying the hangar bay up ahead, you ask. Did I mention that I've never flown a spaceship? Marlin says you'll learn on page 40. Oh, I love these little... <laughs> I know. <laughs> Mar... Always tells us little synopsis for the next page. Yeah. <laughs> you, you will die on page 40. <gasps> 14. Yeah, 14. Go to page 14. The dreaded page 14. Crawling out of the air shaft, you find yourself at the door of the hangar bay, and Marlin fishes in a trunk and pulls out a silvery pressure suit. Step in. I'm attaching a cable to your suit. Explains Marlin. It will shoot you over to my craft. He picks up a piece of headgear and holds it next to your head for fit. I'll maintain radio contact with you through the headphones in here. Marlin gently pushes you through the hangar door pressure lock. Before you stand space, wait, before you stand spacecraft of every description, suddenly the cable attached to your suit is energized. And soon, you're being shot through space. Feet kicking in all directions, your ride ends abruptly when you smack into a small red craft. You push up the hatch and unlocking the cable, you climb inside. Marla's voice crackles through the headset. The remote is all set for air. You study the controls. One lever is pushed forward in a slot marked automatic. Beside it is another slot marked manual. Maybe you should leave the fighting to the experts, or maybe not. Set the controls to manual on page 69 and join the fight, or leave the ship on automatic on page 90 and head for home. Now, I've never flown a spacecraft before, but should I join a war in one? I mean, it is on page 69. It is, and as much as I hate to admit it, that does give me, like, a slight extra percentage wanting to go that way. That would break a tie. Yeah. Well, the Let's tie, there. there's two options, so it's already a tie to 69. The future of Earth is at stake. You're not going to be packed up and sent home like a baby. You're ready to fight in a war. You yank the lever back, locking it in manual. Suddenly, the ship trembles and spins. In terror, you remember that you don't have any idea how to fly this thing. Now? Ah, oh, civilians never follow orders! The old man sputters over your headphones. Push the steering wheel! Fire the counter thrust engine! He barks as you spy a padded stick by your knee. Gentle it forward, easy, with perfect timing, fusion engine, fire front and left. 
Stabilizing the craft, still gulping air but flushed with confidence, you test the steering, while the display board tracks you like a video game. Tingling with excitement, you emerge from a sloppy spiral to notice something is missing. No vertigo, no sickening sense of falling or being squashed by G-forces. You yell into the helmet microphone. Hey Marlin! I can fly! His reply is marked by alarm screaming into the cockpit. Warning flashes across the display board as three waspish fighter planes show up as blips on the screen. Their blips are chasing your blip. It's time to fly or die on page 50. Heart thumping, you gape through your windshield to see three of Lexor's fighter jets approaching. They close. Photon torpedoes aimed at your craft. You bank steeply as one gunship fires, then luring one gunship close, you fire your own series of laser ram rockets. <laughs> they all miss. Frantic now, you open up again. Three, four times. You don't hit a thing as other fighters surround you. Your spirit breaks as you're pitched and tossed by a violent blow. With control gauges winking, the ship shudders to a halt. You've been hit. Don't quit. Turn to page 21. Awaiting the final attack, your mind floods with images of home, of school, of flibber. Eh? Where'd that thought come from? Is Bree calling you telepathically? Flubber. Fire your retro boost engine. Comes Bree's voice in your head. You do as Bree says. Your crippled ship limps out of danger as Bree's Korean space jet swoops down on your attackers and finishes them off with three quick laser blasts. Lumber, follow me to core. Bree urges gently. Our work is done. Marimus is here. He will stop Lexor. But I can't leave! You explode. Lexor's <laughs> after Earth next! <laughs> <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> <laughs> then a colossal starship passes over you, emitting violet rays like feelers. It bears down on Lexor's ship. You know it must be Baramus's Octedron flagship. Bree's right, you decide. Baramus will defeat that nasty knight without you or the Kurians. Then again, Lexor doesn't play by the rules. Maybe you should persuade Bree and the Kurians to stick around just in case. You don't see how you could help. Fly to Kur on page 83. Or convince Bree and the Koreans to stay and fight on page 49. What do you think, Rita? Not much. Oh, here? If you, if you took a chance on a thought, Ooh, what would it be? I wouldn't risk that. <laughs> Fair point well made. All right, the top entrance here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see how you can help fly to Kur on page 83. Let's, uh, you know what? I like the, I like the, blah, 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 man. So let's, let's yeah, talk. exactly. Let's talk to him more on 49. Stay, Bree. You plead. Baramus needs us. If you stay, I stay too. Bree replies telepathically. He rejoins the squad preparing to launch a new attack. A half mile away, Lexor's fighters circle his warship like drones protecting the Queen Bee. You wriggle deep in the pilot's seat, impatiently revving up the emergency engines and wait to launch with the Kurian. But before you can begin, Baramus, is un Baramus unleashes a huge laser bolt at Lexor's fleet. The blast blinds you, and when it fades, you only count wisps of smoke where Lexor's fighters were. In silent awe, you see the evil knight's crippled warship pulse ominously, futilely trying to limp beyond... What is a ship limp? Beyond Baramus's first firing range. Then the pulsing dies, and Lexor's ship is trapped, waiting to be finished off. You count the seconds, wondering why Baramus doesn't put an end to Lexor's quest for tyranny. He must have a reason for holding off. Can't he see something that you don't? Hang back and wait with Baramis on page 13, or go in for a closer look on page 30. Give a thought. It it seems uh, more risky to go in for a closer look. Like, in this situation, you might want to play possum. You might want to play dead for a little bit, and as soon as they come near, strike. So, I don't want to be the person that gets that strike. Page 13. Lucky 13. Fighting impatience, you drop the steering column and wait for Baramis to move. You're too new at this space battle stuff to do anything alone. Just then, Baramus ignites his starboard engine and the flagship moves back. Split seconds later, Luxor fires energy beams that explode in the exact spot that Baramus had been. Shockwaves blow you and the squadron like puffballs, but you're unharmed thanks to Baramus's move out of the firing range. Great galaxy! Luxor was faking defeat! Possum styles! And you almost fell into his trap. Luckily, Baramus was warned by Marlin in time. You sigh, hoping that that was Lexor's last trick. A moment later, swarms of enemy wasp fighters zoom in from nowhere. You can't believe it. The Evil Knight had more gunships hidden in space. 
hypnotized by his force. You stare at the black fighters that keep coming and coming and coming until you lose count. This adds up to big trouble on page 77. <laughs> Again and again, the fighters pound Baramus's flagship while the Kurians streak in to draw their fire. You're left behind, feeling useless and nearly weaponless, with just one remaining laser rocket. Even Bree has joined the fray. Is there some way that you can help? A bold thought races through your mind. Maybe one ship could inflict damage on Lexus' warship, but how? Almost immediately, your headset crackles, and it's Marlin. You can barely hear his raspy voice beneath the static. Has he been trying to contact you all along? That must be it. Energy from the laser weapons has been jamming the frequency. Suddenly, you slip beneath the warship's belly and his message clears. Knock out the red communications panel! The only one, the one just below the hangar bay. And don't waste any more time! On the way, Marlin! You yell into the microphone. You're back in action on page 60. Your craft skims closely along the warship's hull, trying to ignore blast reflections from the ongoing battle that illuminate the cockpit. In seconds, the hangar bay looms ahead, and you drop into hover mode to locate the panel. It's there you notice with sinking stomach that Marlin mentioned only one red panel, not two. Another flash of laser light draws your eyes spaceward as the trio of wasp fighters dive at you. Spotted now, you grab for the rocket trigger. Hurry, you got it! One choice! To pick the correct panel, the left one or the right one! Well, uh... Hmm. It's... it's a guess. <laughs> Literally just a guess. All right, let's go to the one that's nearest then on page 68. All right, it's the right one. Now let's see if it's the right one. The rocket blows out the right panel with a blast, and reeling from the shock, you regain control and prepare to dodge your attackers. Clammy cold, you search for them, wondering if you completed the mission successfully. Strange. The trio of fighters stalking you has disappeared. Stranger still, as you skim the battle zone, you see that swarms of Lexer's fighters have become silly. Directionless bees flying in circles suddenly realize you did hit the communications panel. And more. Unknowingly, you've also disarmed the knight's drones, pilotless drones he must have directed by remote control, with a ship-to-ship -ship system. Marlin! Bree! We did it! We stopped Lexor! You shout into the headset as Baramus fires the last photon torpedo at Lexor's warship. Your pounding heart stops when it explodes. Your pounding heart stops when it explodes. <laughs> well, it's been a good run. <laughs> Does Baramis know that Marlin is still trapped in the ship? Instantly, your craft is aimed for Lexor's hangar bay. You won't let Marlin share Lexor's fate. Go get him on page 45. Forgetting your own safety, you race to the warship, maneuvering onto the hangar bay. Smoking wreckage surrounds Marlin, who lies unconscious near a yawning hole in the bulkhead. You jump from the craft and speed to him, grabbing his wrist. You feel for a pulse. He's alive. You strain to lift him, but even the old man, though the old man is thin, his bulky spacesuit makes him awkward. Finally, exhausted, you rest, unsure now if you can ever haul him into your small ship. You've had some first aid training, but you don't know if it'll help Marlin now. You also fear there may, might not be enough time to revive him before the ship blows up. Will you try and haul Marlin aboard your craft or try and revive him first on page 7? Yeah, 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 just pop his helmet off so we can give him some CPR. <laughs> yes. That is true. What training would we know? That is spacesuit accessible. Yes. I think we got to bring him aboard the craft. I think so, too. It's also the Nintendo 64 page, so I'm in. That's, uh, you know, one of my favorite Nintendo 64 games. Star Fox 64. Also space game? Coincidence? I think so. You grab Marlin again as the ship tilts, suddenly dropping several feet. You fall, scrabbling for a foothold. You slide into the craft, dragging along Marlin's limp body. You both stop at the craft's landing shanks with dread. You realize that Lexor's ship is breaking up. Now! Braced in the craft's hatchway, you clutch the cowl on Marlin's spacesuit, and after a giant heave, his body slides inside. And you jump over him, ram the craft at a high gear, and race for space. The contest ends seconds short of safety. An intense internal force rips Luxor's ship apart, hurting your crap, hurtling your craft through space and you into unconsciousness. Is this it? The end of everything? Find out on page 92. Marlin's voice rouses you from unconsciousness sometime later. Young friend! Thank goodness you're alive! He exclaims, shaking your shoulder. Quiet, good Merlin. Comes a deep, soothing voice. You look up from the bed on which you're lying to see a tall, silver-haired man with kind, browned eyes. Save your strength, says Baramus to Marlin. Bree reported your plight long before he left Kor. Our tractor beam brought you both aboard. You'll be Macron beamed home. Baramus assures you. But first, brave deeds must be rewarded. 
Kneel there. He orders, lifting a sword handle from which he projects a shimmering laser light. Careful now, dude. Baramis, no. <laughs> Baramis's laser sword buzzes you gently on each shoulder. I dub thee liege of the Octedron Order. Rise and be known forevermore <laughs> as knight of the star-spangled scanner. Can I be known as something else? <laughs> yeah, anything else. <laughs> anything else? Uh, champion of Little Debbie. Yes, thank you. You rise feeling proud, but you can hardly believe it when Baramus hands you his laser sword. Take this sword, he says, as a symbol of your knighthood. You look at the sword in awe. You've come a long way in your search for the perfect science fair entry, but Fred will have to go a very long way to beat this science project after we decapitate him with it. The end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Oh hey Did Fred! It. I've got one of those. Uh, I've got one of those vocal transcoders. You hold it to your throat, then you press the button, and Ooh. then and then you it, it just it, it interprets that into voice. That's... Here we go, Fred. That's oh god. That's metal. <laughs> uh, dang. We did we I from the cover. I was thinking. Yeah, I was thinking. Et. We went full Star mm. War. Absolutely full Star War. But we we but it was interesting though because we we went. Arthurian legend Star War. Yeah, but, exactly. I, I gotta say, like, out of all of, like, the micro niches within sci-fi, one of my favorites is taking old Earth stuff and just being like, yeah, that's in space too. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the Warhammer, like, folk just being knights, just totally just 100% knights, sick as hell. Yeah, I'm with it. I enjoyed it. It was a, it was a nice, campy, classic 80s sci-fi I've seen Star Wars time. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> and you know, it's been a good it's been a good time, Twist Supply in general. The, you know, it's been there's been some ups and downs, but some of the ups have been ooh, they've been up. Ooh, they've been up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I don't know. I think in general, it was a nice time. It definitely felt like reminiscence reminiscent of the Give Yourself Goosebumps kind of books for sure. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to get basically 18 more sort of give yourself goosebumps books is how I uh, have felt about these. It's, it's nice. Mm. It was a really nice time. I have to say, I really, really, really love the the images that are included here in pretty much all of these books. Like, they're not always in a consistent art style, uh, but man, they really, really add a lot to the, the environment. I find it's myself true. picturing the characters in future pages in their incarnations from the previous ones. It's true. Just see, I know it's like, you know, audio podcasts and all, but just the inclusion of some in general is kind of, is just kind of nice. If you were reading through them, I think you'd appreciate it too. The, like the imagery of the, uh, the gold bald man hunched over with the big old wrinkled forehead, like mm -hmm. it's burned into my brain. And it, I feel like it does help influence how, if, 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 even if the audience can't see it, it will influence how we, narrate it or oh, voice it and stuff like that so like it it, it adds a nice little uh, nice little touch there uh but yeah I, i've enjoyed it and i've enjoyed the old twist of plots it's been a good old time do you have any closing yes, thoughts indeed i don't in particular other than that uh, there are actually pieces of art from the series in general that i think i want to go back and clip out just because they were so damn good especially the uh the i was it techno witch Oh, I think, yes, I think so. Oh my God. All of the images in that one could easily be tattoos. You could tattoo them on you and you'd be fine. Uh, that's it. Any, yeah. any particular closing thoughts on the, uh, on the old twist of plot for you? No, I don't think so. I think I got them all. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, well, speaking of a good time, then, do you want to say? probably say that we, uh, uh, should give out a special thanks to the executive producer of this episode of Turn to Page, Alex Dredd. Much appreciated, Alex Dredd, for supporting over on patreon.com slash turn to page cast that are above the hardcover tier. That is where the executive producers are from. But of course, we appreciate any and all support, both over there on the Patreon, as well as in general, abroad across the internet. Ways you can do that include, of course, following and subscribing over on the YouTube channel, YouTube at turn to page cast, I believe, youtube.com slash yep. at turn to page cast. Correct. Uh, as well as uh, leaving a review on any of the websites that you listen to this on, any of the podcast services that you should happen to use, 
is very, very, very helpful and uh, would be much appreciated as we are going towards our next season. It is so true. Word of mouth, also very helpful. If you know anybody who might be interested, you can send them a season that you think lines up with their fancy. Uh, and say, go get him, champ. Toss him a link and pat him on the back and say, you got this. Also a very helpful, nice thing you can do. Hey, should we, uh, should we tease a little bit what we've got coming up in the future? It's going to be, we're going to be taking a bit of a break because A, I'm moving. B, you're busy. C, we take breaks in between big season shifts anyway so it's just it's gonna be at least at least a week hopefully we'll be back after that but there's a chance mm -hmm. there's a chance we need more time uh to get gives us some time to get all our ducks in a row as well as the art for the new season but should i should i give a little little spoiler <laughs> on what it shall absolutely be? yeah we're gonna be going and doing a a brief foray into some of the newer or the newer endless quest dungeons and dragons endless quest choose your own adventure books we saw there's tons of endless quest books a lot of them are very hard to track down but there are some newer mm. ones and they seem pretty well reviewed too people seem to uh, like them from what i gathered uh mm -hmm. and it sounds kind of nice to go back to a a, a brief foray into a, a sort of short series of truly high fantasy uh especially i think they're going to be more game books like you are playing mm. a class you you are playing a class that they give you for that book and i i, I think that they're going to be a little bit more game booky and i'm i'm excited to go back into that realm exactly they're, they'll be a little more dense i can only imagine but of course set in a very familiar setting in uh dungeons and dragons yeah but i'm looking forward to that again May maybe a little bit, little bit, taking a week off, and then and then we'll see what happens. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Thank you all for tuning in for another season of, tw of another season of Twist of Plot. <laughs> no, that's not the, the very first season of Twist of Plot, and, and the last one. There's no more books. More, the only one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless someone out there writes a new Twist of Plot, a fan submitted Twist of Plot, then uh, <laughs> then yeah. Uh, but hey. Yeah, that's going to do it for this season of Turn to Page. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And, uh, hey, during the time off, go back and watch, uh, listen to a little one-off or something. If you missed a past episode on either, like, you know, of Twas or uh, uh, the Dracula was book was really, really yep. good. Like, those are I nice. Was, I was very specifically going to recommend yeah. the Twas the Night Before uh, Krampus Knocked yeah. as well as the Dracula. Yeah, those ones are good because they're nice, clean, like, one-offs that you would maybe finish in the, the same amount of time that we'd be off, or you could go listen to, maybe you missed the uh, the Animorphs. We did a, a two-book run on that. Like, those are nice, quick ones that you could probably go listen to in between the time that you would otherwise have an episode. But hey, that is that. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Adios.